This episode is sponsored by Celestron, manufacturer of high-quality telescopes and an industry leader in developing exciting optical products with revolutionary technologies. I'm Kelly Beatty of Sky and Telescope magazine, and tonight we're going on a tour of the stars and planets that you'll see overhead during February. First, we'll keep tabs on the moon, spot three planets before dawn, say goodbye to Jupiter, trace out the winter hexagon, and explore some lesser-known constellations near Orion. So grab your curiosity and a warm coat and come along on this month's Sky Tour. As each month begins, I like to imagine what the moon will look like over the next few weeks and where it'll be in the sky. Usually, I make a mental note of the month's first major lunar phase, and in this case, it's a snap, because new moon falls on February 1st. Next comes first quarter on the 8th, referring to the fact that the moon has traveled a quarter of the way around its orbit since new moon a week earlier. On this night, the moon looks like a half of a circle in the sky, with a straight line marking sunrise across the lunar landscape, and the rounded edge pointing the way toward the sun. Yes, it's a semicircle, but it is the case that we are seeing just one quarter of the moon's total surface, front and back. Anyway, first quarter is followed by full moon on February 16th. Native Americans in the Northeast U.S. knew it as the full snow moon for obvious reasons. Third, or last quarter, falls on the 23rd. Late this month, the lunar crescent wanes, or gets thinner, as it glides across the pre-dawn sky, and that offers some worthwhile rewards if you can get yourself outside before the sun rises. For most of us northerners, sunrise doesn't come until about 7 a.m. early in February, so it's not much of a challenge to get up before dawn. And, truth is, there's plenty of action in the sky before sunrise. So let's explore what you'll see. If you're up early enough and it's still dark, you'll notice something strangely familiar about the stars arrayed overhead. Look towards south, and you'll recognize the distinctive arc of Scorpius. Well up in the east are Vega, Deneb, and Altair, corners of the Summer Triangle. These are indeed the stars of summer, so what's going on? Well, several months from now, Earth will have swung about halfway around in its orbit, and that change will cause a big westward shift of these stars and constellations, from the morning sky into the evening sky. Conversely, stars we're now seeing after sunset will have swung around into the pre-dawn sky. Once you've gotten used to seeing those stars, look low in the east, ideally about 30 to 45 minutes before sunrise. Easiest to spot is brilliant Venus over in the southeast. Look to its lower right, closer to the horizon by about half the width of your clenched fist at arm's length, to spot Mars. Throughout February, Venus and Mars will gradually march higher before dawn. Now don't confuse Mars with the star Antares, which is three fists farther to the right toward west. Throughout the second week of February, you have a chance to spot a third planet sneaking up on Venus from the lower left. That's Mercury. Now, if you're a Sky Tour regular, and I hope you are, recall that last month we looked for Mercury in the evening sky. Hey, this planet is named after the fleet-footed mythical messenger for a reason. Mercury takes only 88 days to orbit the Sun. And so from our perspective, it jumps from one side of its orbit to the other every month and a half. Get up early around February 18th for your best chance to spot Mercury, Venus, and Mars clustered together in the pre-dawn sky. By month's end, the 26th and 7th, Mercury will have dropped from view, but a beautiful crescent moon will have slid into the southeastern sky in its place. That makes for a very pretty trio with Venus and Mars. Let's turn our attention to the evening sky, where Jupiter is waving goodbye very low in the west after sunset. To spot this planet at all, you'll need to find a clear, unobstructed view in the direction of sunset. Look about 45 minutes after the sun goes down. It'll be decently easy to spot Jupiter early in February, but a real challenge at month's end. This is often the coldest month of the year for northerners, but the sun is telling a different story. 
The December solstice came and went several weeks ago, and you can already notice that the days are getting longer, with earlier sunrises and later sunsets. The celestial geometry is changing, too, as the sun is starting to slide farther north in the sky. In fact, during February, the sun races northward among the stars by about one degree every three days. Heck, in no time at all, we'll be on the threshold of spring. But the stars of winter are still firmly in control of the nighttime firmament. Let's track a few of them down. Note where the sun sets, and once twilight starts to envelop you, wheel around to the left until you're looking in nearly the opposite direction. The night sky's most dazzling star is Sirius, down near the southeastern horizon. Also known as the Dog Star, Sirius appears so bright, partly because it is bright, outshining the sun by 25 times, and partly because it's relatively close by, only eight and a half light years away. Above Sirius is the distinctive pattern of Orion the Hunter, the quintessential constellation of winter, or of summer, I suppose, if you live in Australia. Orion is unmistakable, even if you suffer from lots of light pollution, with three stars in a tight diagonal row marking his belt, surrounded by a tall, boxy quartet of bright stars to frame his torso. To the belt's upper left is the red supergiant star Betelgeuse, which marks Orion's left shoulder. Now, you'd never guess it, because it's 428 light-years away, but Betelgeuse is one of the biggest stars known. If you swapped it for our sun, its surface would be somewhere between Mars and Jupiter, and Earth digested into star stuff. To the upper right of Betelgeuse, by about twice the width of your clenched fist held at arm's length, is another red giant star. That's Aldebaran, the angry eye of the bull Taurus. Look closely. As with Antares in the morning sky, both of these beacons have a reddish tinge that sets them apart, subtly, from the stars around them. As you look around this part of the sky, you'll notice a bunch of bright stars. Sky gazers often trace out an enormous six-sided pattern called the winter hexagon that connects them. To find it, imagine that Betelgeuse is in the middle of the hexagon. To its lower right, on the other side of Orion's belt, is icy white Rigel, marking the hunter's knee or foot. From there, slide your gaze to the lower left by three fists until you reach Sirius. Continue clockwise around the hexagon, heading upper left by three fists to reach the star Procyon. Now, glide to the upper left until you reach Pollux and above it, Castor. These are the twins of Gemini. Continue to the upper right of the twins, almost to overhead, to find Capella. From there, it's a three-fist hop down to Aldebaran, and another three-fist hop brings you back to Rigel. There you have it, the winter hexagon. Rigel, Sirius, Procyon, Pollux, Capella, and Aldebaran, with Betelgeuse anchoring the middle. Even if you suffer from awful light pollution, these stellar sparklers will be hard to miss. Now, in mythology, Orion is a famed hunter, and maybe for that reason the ancients surrounded him with several types of prey. Now, Aldebaran and the stars of Taurus, the bull, are to Orion's upper right, but I'm talking about other critters that are looking right around Orion and even right under his feet. For example, shift your gaze just to the hunter's right, the region of sky just below Taurus. Even if you don't have a lot of light pollution, you'll see that there's not much there. But every bit of the sky belongs to one constellation or another, and the wide expanse just to Orion's west is a huge but very dim constellation named Eridanus, representing an ancient mythical river. It begins at the foot of Orion, near Rigel, and meanders sideways and downward for quite a distance. Its brightest star, Akronar, is well below the horizon for us northerners, but Akronar is a prominent nighttime beacon for those in the southern hemisphere. Now look to Orion's left, and again you'll notice lots of rather starless real estate between the great hunter and brilliant Sirius. Ah, but there are plenty of stars here, even though they're faint, and they form a sizable constellation named Manasaurus, the unicorn. Its head and horn are just to the left of Betelgeuse, and the body stretches eastward between Procyon and Sirius, with the hind end about two fists to the upper left of Sirius. 
And if Orion is such a great hunter, how can he miss a celestial hare, the constellation Lepus, right under his feet? I like spotting Lepus because it does look like its namesake. Its head is on the right, marked by a small trapezoid of four stars, with pointy ears extending upward to just beneath Rigel, and to their left is an arc of stars along this hare's back and hindquarters. Now, for extra credit, and I'm especially talking to those of you who live farther south, there's yet one more bit of prey hidden beneath Lepus, about two fists lower down. That would be Columba, the dove. It made its first appearance on star maps in the late 16th century as Columba Noaki, Noah's dove, which the biblical boat builder released after the Great Flood. It later returned with an olive branch in its beak, signifying that dry land was nearby. That's about it for this month. If you want more tips for viewing the night sky, including a free interactive star chart for any time or date, check out our website, skyandtelescope.org. If you haven't already subscribed, you can find this Sky Tour on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. And please do leave a rating or review. It will help others find the show. And if you want to explore the solar system and universe more deeply, please check out the full line of binoculars and telescopes available at Celestron.com. Sky Tour is a production of Sky and Telescope, a division of the American Astronomical Society, and is produced each month by me, Kelly Beatty. Next month, I'll introduce you to twin brothers who've really made a name for themselves in the sky. Until then, I wish you clear skies. <laughs>